you're about to watch is Up by the Bootstraps. Now, Up by the Bootstraps is uh, something I've done on Black Republicans. Most of the filming was done back in April of 2004. And what's interesting about it is shortly after that, Bill Cosby, who I think most of us categorize as a Black Republican, made some comments about the, the state of the Afro-American community that uh, caused a lot of confusion and a lot of back and forth with that. But with this documentary, I interviewed three black Republicans, New York black, Repu black Republicans, and when you watch it, it gives most of us an insight on uh, the mindset of black Republicans. And hopefully at the end of this, it would encourage Afro-Americans to be, to be more selective about how we vote. I uh, noticed that my, I myself also, when I would vote, I would always automatically go Democratic, straight down, vote Democratic. Never really looked at the party or the party's agenda. And interviewing these three Republicans, what I found interesting was they informed me or made me aware of a lot of things that the Republican Party has done for the black community, a lot that we don't know. So I'm not, I'm not pro-Republican or pro-Democratic. What I just want is for people to watch this documentary and with an open mind and I hope that you walk away from it um, I hope it influences how you vote that once again that you become more selective about who you vote for and um, that's it uh, like I said there are three uh, very interesting uh, people I spoke to in this that helped me along with this I want to thank them for that and here you go here with Miss Lolita Jackson, the president of the Metropolitan Club here in New York City on 83rd Street. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Could you tell us about the club? The club was founded in 1902 by Teddy Roosevelt supporters. Um, it is the oldest and the largest Republican club in Manhattan. It's located on Upper East Side, and the Upper East Side is the home of what used to be termed Rockefeller Republicans, which is a moderate Republican politics, usually socially moderate but fiscally conservative. So our old, our, our past members include Teddy Roosevelt himself, Nelson Rockefeller, uh, Mayor Rudolph Giuliani, Jacob Javits. This is really the bastion of uh, Republican politics here in Manhattan. Okay, how'd you get involved? What interested you? Um, I've always been a Republican. I've never been a Democrat. Um, really? But I never uh, was active in politics until I moved here. And what happened was uh, in 1994, there was someone running for Congress uh, and he was standing at my subway station in New York. Uh, many people do their politicking by staying at subway stations because you get a lot of foot traffic. I didn't know that. And uh, yes, that's basically one of the main uh, ways of getting your message out is by handing out literature at subway stations. So uh, this particular person was running for Congress and I thought he was quite attractive. So I said, I'll take his flyer. I had, oh, no, okay. party, I had no idea <laughs> what party he was. And I took his flyer and I read it and I agreed with everything he said. And I said, wow, he's a Republican. Finally, somebody who I can identify with. And I wrote his campaign a letter, because back then there was no email and no um, websites, so I had to write the campaign a letter. It just 10 years ago, right? 1994. 1994. And um, if you recall, that was the first year of Giuliani being mayor. Pataki was not governor yet, and uh, the Democrats controlled 
both houses of Congress and they had the presidency, so Republicans were very much still irre irrelevant. Locally in the Upper East Side, we had five out of the six elected positions. The Upper East Side was always electing Republicans, but nationally we were not on the scene. So what happened was that was a very hotly contested congressional race because uh, it was one of the six races that they had targeted to help get the House back. Um, and he was one of the six candidates that did not sign a contract with America. So he got a oh, lot of attention okay. because of that. Um, and as a result of that, I got uh, involved with the campaign, long story short. I wrote his position paper on welfare reform. Because of the fact that it was a very hotly contested campaign, I was on TV a couple times picture of the New York Times. Anytime we were around him, there, were a lot, there was a lot of uh, activity. So okay. there was a lot of fun, and I realized that I really liked being involved in politics at the grassroots level, helping people campaign and going to debates and hosting fundraisers. And I just joined this club, because this was his home club at that time. Um, he was a sitting city councilman when he was running for Congress. Um, so I joined the club, like everyone else from the campaign did. And just through the years, have risen through the ranks, got named the district leader of this area of the Upper East Side. And what that means is it's your responsibility to help qualify people for the ballot. A lot of people don't realize you actually have to get signatures, petition signatures, uh, to, and you have to get a certain amount in order to qualify for the ballot here in New York. So I make sure, I help make sure that that gets done, help um, interview candidates who want to run for office, and represent the, uh, the party uh, to the county. And I'm also a member of the state committee, which means uh, there's two delegates uh, for the state committee from each uh, assembly district. And so it's myself. It's always a woman and a man. A lot of people don't realize that. It's, uh, it has to be one of each. Um, so there's two uh, representing each assembly district in uh, New York. And I'm one of those. You sound very busy. Yes. And I'm also uh, an alternate delegate to the Republican National oh. Convention. So there's a lot going on. But I always feel that... You can't complain unless you're involved. So I, I felt so. that if there was something that I, that meant a lot to me and it was important to me to get what I felt my core beliefs were out there and to get heard, I had to be involved and I had to eventually get to a leadership position. And this is, as I said, the oldest and largest club. Uh, we have 500 members. Um, we are one of only three clubs in New York with our own uh, property. We've been in this building since 1930. We this was built as our clubhouse. So it's never been anything but our clubhouse. Um, Just so that people can see the show. Sure. President. Now, okay. Michael declared that he was running for mayor at one of our events in 2000. Michael Bloomberg. Yes. That's the current mayor. The okay. current mayor declared that he was running for mayor at one of our events. So we do have a, a very, very strong history here in the Upper Side and in New York politics. Now, you had gone to school in Pennsylvania, right? Yes. Oh, what did you major in? I majored in engineering, okay. um, and I took a lot of classes in the business school. I went to University of Pennsylvania. Okay. On a grant or? Uh, just full financial aid package. So it was about, a, I'd say, half grant, and then the other half was loan and work study. So I actually graduated with $45,000 in debt. So would you say that you've pulled yourself up by the bootstraps? Absolutely. I mean. Uh, and you believe anyone, anyone can do I this? I think in today's day and age, to blame someone else for your condition without trying to better it yourself is not going to get you to where you need to go. I mean, for me, um, my background was not wealthy in any way. Oh. I got either fee waivers or paid for all of my college applications. I worked every summer that I was in school. Even when I was going to summer school at Penn, I still had jobs while I was there. Um, I knew the ticket for me to get out of the situation I was in was to make sure I went to class and got good grades and got to go to a good school. And I didn't have the SAT prep classes. I got good SATs, but I studied and I worked hard. Um, and certainly there are people who are not able to have you know, the, the, the drive that I had to yeah. get out of the situation. That's why I feel it's really important for people in situations that I'm in now, uh, working uh, for big corporations or having access to uh, resources that can help younger people, if they go back and tutor, if they go back and teach kids how to take the SATs, how to write those college applications, um, the importance of voting, all the things that I think that we take for granted or, you know, if, if they're not happening for us, you, you tend to blame other people. You can control your own destiny to a certain degree. 30 years ago, 50 years ago, you couldn't. Now, if you are reasonably intelligent and you are diligent, you can go to college and you can change your situation. And that's a message that I try to get out in everything that I do. Okay. When looking at the black community right now, it's almost assumed that we're democratic. Uh, 
when looking at the black community, it's almost assumed that we're all democratic. Now, is that a good assumption, or do you think that that's accurate? Or I think, unfortunately, it is accurate. And I say, unfortunately, because we basically have taken ourselves out of the game. Okay. You notice what's happened with both parties? They're not even trying to cultivate the black vote. No, they've skipped I over that. us, and yes. they've gone over to the Hispanic vote. Our vote's not in play. You look at the New York mayoral election. The reason that Michael Bloomberg is the mayor is because Mark Green said, I don't need minorities to win, I just need them to govern. What happened was Michael Bloomberg received 25% of the black vote and 49% of the Hispanic vote. He would not have won if that had not happened. We didn't realize the power that we can have in these elections, particularly in times like now, when you, know, you have a 50-50 country. Every vote counts. Republicans understand this. I don't think the Democrats are waking up to that yet. And what's going to happen is if John Kerry's not careful, he's going to lose. And actually, that's what we're counting on. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, so how do you see the future of this country going as far as is this election coming up? I think that Bush think? is going to win, and not just because I'm a Republican. I don't think you can win a race by saying I'm the anti-so-and-so. You have to say what you're for, not who you're not. You have to say who you are. Kerry has not done that. He has not effectively engaged and involved the black or Hispanic communities. People, don't, people are not looking at that. How many black uh, people are high up in his uh, campaign? How many Hispanics are high up in his campaign? Just going to a black church once every Sunday or every other Sunday does not make you uh, sensitive to black issues. That's true. And I, don't, I haven't seen anything else that he's done. A lot of blacks right now are intimidated by George Bush. They don't think that he has our interests at heart. I think that is faulty logic. I think, if anything, creating a culture of personal accountability while still being sensitive yes. to people is what needs to happen. I think the problem is that the execution of some of the ideas that have come out of um, the Bush administration, unfortunately, are not communicated uh, in the way that they should be with enough sensitivity sometimes to yes. certain communities. But I do think that um, some of the things that are put out there, for example, no child left behind is not flexible as it should be, but something needed to be done. You look at some of these horrible schools where kids are, I was a mentor in Harlem for seven years. I'm a trustee of an organization called the Children's Aid Society that uh, services 150,000 children a year. We have uh, centers and sites all over New York. And I can tell you that some of the kids that I've mentored they you know, show me some of the work that their teacher gives them and some of the things they copy off the board. And you have some incompetent teachers out there. And because there's no mechanism for a child to be taken out of a bad school that's, that's easy to do without the teachers union crying foul, I have a real problem with that. I mean, for me, that's really why I'm a Republican is I'm a strong believer in vouchers and school choice and charter schools and anything that allows a kid from a poor background to go to better school than they're going to right now. It's not fair to make the children pay for adults' mistakes. And that's basically what's happening now by people who are saying they're against uh, school choice and against vouchers, that it's going to hurt bad schools. Well, you know what? Bad schools deserve to be hurt. Sorry. Now, do you like or did you ever like hip hop at all? I listened to it. Um, like fact, who? I would say I was really into uh, Tribe Called Quest, oh, Jungle okay. Brothers, and sort of the more fun hip hop, yeah. the, the more intense versions of it. Uh, it's hard for me to get into because I just feel like it's glorifying lots of money and women with big booties. <laughs> and for me, I think it's, it, you know, I'm not a person that's going to say it's all misogynist because I think, you know, Talib Kweli, uh, I can't, I'm not sure if I'm saying his name right, yes, Kanye that's West, that's yes. people like that, I really like what they have to say, most but depth. that seems to be put to the most depth, love most depth, but I yes. think those are the people that are sort of put to the side and, and you get the glorification of, you know, skeet, 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 you know, <laughs> I mean, what is that doing for the black community? Yes. Because then everybody is spending money on their nails and their hair and not getting the jobs they need and not, you know, saving the money. And black people do not have equity and do not have wealth. We do not, as, as Chris Rock said, it's the difference between being rich and being wealthy. And I totally agree with Please, that. Please explain that. Explain that. Now, that I'm lost on. <laughs> well, for example, I would like to see how many black people above the age of 30 actually have more than $20,000 in 401k or that they even participate in the 401ks of their jobs. When you start a job for a big company, first thing they tell you is after a year, you can opt into the 401k system. Yes, they do. you're saving money before yes, you even do. see it. Yeah. I want to know how many people have more than $25,000 in that after the age of 30, and I bet you it's a lot less people than you think. They'd rather go out and get the new bends, get the rims, as uh, Chris Rock said. Yeah. All the things that they're focusing on is for today, but when they're 65, then what? 
I mean, the, the days of having those pensions just coming to you just because, that's over. If you read about Enron, all those things, people read about that think it doesn't affect you. It does affect you. It affects you more than you think. So what about those people that look at you and say, oh, she's just hating? I'm not hating. Okay. The first thing I did when I started Morgan Stanley, and I was making 25000 a year when I got out of Penn and started working for Morgan Stanley. The first thing I did, I didn't have a pot to piss in, but I said, you know what, I'm still putting money in the 401k. That 401k grew to six figures because I just kept letting the money go in there. Didn't touch it. By the time I was 35, that was six figures. And I didn't okay. have to do anything but just keep letting my money go in there. That's equity you build up. So I'm not hating. Anybody <laughs> can do it. It wasn't me saying, I'm making 150000 so I can afford to save. Any job you have, you can save $10 a week instead of getting your nails done yes. with the money in the bank. That's all I'm saying. I stopped going out for coffee every morning because I realized how much I was spending on it. Really? It's something uh, so I learned from someone who I used to work with. He calls it the latte factor. Okay. Um, if you just take that four dollars you would say put in that uh, venti latte and put it in the bank, or at least don't spend it, at the end of the month, how much money do you have? And I'm you a Starbucks fan. I'm a big year. Starbucks fan. Right, but that's what I'm saying. Yeah. You, you, if you go to Starbucks two or three times a day, you're probably spending ten to twelve dollars. Yeah, yeah. Three hundred dollars a month on Starbucks. So I mean, it starts to add up the little stuff. You know, maybe have one less drink when you go out. Yeah. I mean it. it and I'm, I'm in a position now where I don't necessarily, quote unquote, have to do those things, but I still have those habits yeah. because I know that I want to be at a certain place in my life. I want to have a certain type of apartment, house, and maybe I'm not going to have it right now. But yeah. there's priorities that you have to make in your life, and sometimes you have to give something up now to get what you want ultimately. Now, uh, on the subject of hip-hop again, did you, read, did you hear about all these big-name superstar rappers that aren't even registered voters or haven't voted in 10 years. Oh, like, yes, and I, I have an opinion on that. For people who hate on me and say, well, how can you be a Republican? I, I ask them, have you voted every year since you were 18? When's the last time you did vote? If you didn't vote, I don't want to hear it because at least I'm involved and engaged. And I will tell you this, as a black woman, I am listened to much more by this side of the aisle than the other side of the aisle. Really? When you say this side of the aisle, you mean... Uh... By the Republican Party. Oh, okay, all right. I'm, I'm saying because black, of the fact issue. that I worked hard through the party, I, went, I worked through the system, I became president of this club not because I'm black, but because I was the person that was chosen to lead it. This is the old white guys club, quote unquote. Yes, This it is. is like the That's Upper East Side bastion. And people still believe that. Most people still, when you think Republican, the average person thinks a uh, white guy... 45 and up. Right, and that's just simply not true. I mean, I'm friends with the people, some of the people who run the Law Cabinet Republicans, which is the gay Republican group. There's a larger Hispanic group uh, founded. There's a couple of them. There's a Cuban uh, Hispanic group. There's also just a general mainstream one, Washington Heights. And, and uh, a lot of Dominicans belong to a club in Washington Heights now. So we are really reaching out as a party. And people don't see that because they see the five people on TV, but particularly in New York City. New York City is a very diasporic uh, place. You can't just be leaning on one particular ethnic group. Yes. And I think the Republican Party, particularly in the city, has done a really good job of reaching out. The Harlem Club, um, they have a fabulous um, membership, and they also have a facility that they meet in. Um, and we do a lot of cross events with them now, um, particularly as me being in charge of this club. I've reached out to some of the clubs around the city to have events together. Oh. Now, tell me about some of the recent publicity you received. I, I think there was, an art, there was an article on you in the New York Times, I believe in New, was it New? It was News, uh, New, York New, York, Mag no, New, New York, York Magazine, Magazine and then also the New York Times. Um, what happened was with the convention coming to New York, a lot of people were fascinated because we're sort of like the zoo animals. We're, <laughs> we're, you know, we're like ex extinct or exotic yeah. species. Like, oh, there's New York City Republicans? And we've been here, we've been here for years. I think that people finally uh, decided to take a look at that and see who was here and who was active. Um, so the New York uh, Magazine people called the New York County organization and asked for who they felt that they should interview, and I was one of the names given. Um, I actually am friends with three of the other people who were interviewed for that as well. So that's, that was an interesting journey. And then the New York Times article happened uh, because they wanted to speak to my immediate predecessor as president. They thought he was still president. And then he said, no, it's not me. It's a, it's a woman named Alita Jackson, and she's, she's done a lot for the others. I think they were fascinated by my personal story um, in that, you know, as I said earlier, this is a club that's not considered... A, a, you know, a black club, quote unquote. So it was kind of interesting to them that I was a black female leading this club, and then I'm younger. And also, I survived the uh, World Trade Center disaster twice. Yes, so I, I heard about that. I heard. Intrigued by the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, Same jazz. So 
um, it's not the typical Republican background that people think of, but the thing I'm trying to tell people is there's a lot of people involved in the party just like me. I'm not an anomaly. I'm not an anomaly as a black person, I'm not an anomaly as a young person or as a woman. Uh, I know a number of people just like me, and, and, and my goal is to have those people see the light of day. And the convention coming here has been really helpful in, in getting that out. Actually, our club has gained about 100 members in the last two months alone, three months alone, uh, just from, you know, me being in the news and also just uh, the club being out there, people knowing what, and the convention coming. So there's a lot of interest in getting involved and in, in being um, an active Republican. And I think it's a myth when people say that New York is just a Democratic town. Yeah. A lot of people who move from other places um, who were Republicans wherever they were and they're happy to see that we're here. I've talked to people in Harlem who say, you know what? What has Charlie Rangel done for me in the last 10 years? Why do I keep pulling the lever for him? So there are people who are open yeah. to what we have to say. And all I'm saying is this. You don't have to register as a Republican. Just weigh the issues of whoever's talking to you. And if you decide that the Republican is saying what you want to hear, be willing to vote for that person if they have your interests at heart. Because you should not just pull a lever because somebody has a D next to their name if they don't great. have your interests at heart. That's great. Because, I mean, I look at the fact, and not to disparage anybody, but the Apollo almost went bankrupt. And that's a, you know, a, a black iconic a landmark, building. Yeah. It's a landmark. So, you know, the fact that that happened and there was no accountability really there, that's a reason to question, well, who's in office is letting that happen? That's, That's all right. I'm saying. I'm not pointing fingers, <laughs> but you got to look at that. Now, in your honest opinion, how do you feel about the current state of the black community? I think we're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I think black folks need to wake up. I mean... Please I, elaborate. Huh? Please elaborate. I mean, elaborate. I just feel that as a community, we're focusing on the wrong things. I think that anyone who says a dissenting opinion from the you know, black opinion is being, is made to feel as a sellout rather than people actually listening to what they have to say. Um, I feel, especially as a woman, I feel that people automatically disparage the message without really listening and really paying attention and not really, for example, a prime example, the NAACP, I believe it was, or maybe it was the Urban League, one of the two, um, completely disparaged Bush before he came into office, said he's going to be a horrible president and he's terrible and we hate him and all these horrible things. Well, guess what he won? Yeah. Which means that he had every right to say, you know what, I'm not giving you any money. Of course, that's not what he did, but I think that we're not astute enough to understand that if we're not part of the conversation, we're left out. Not only on the Republican side, but on the Democratic side. Because as I said before, Mark Green said, I don't need you to win, I just need you to govern. If you're not effectively engaging uh, both parties to understand what our issues are and to see what their solutions are, not just one party, both parties, no one's really going to listen to you because the Democrats, they have already checked off the black vote and said, well, they're going to vote for us. Because yes, the last time, yes, it was 90% yes. for Gore, 9% for Bush. Even if we moved that number up to 15%, so even if it was, you know, a Democratic majority landslide for the black community, if we moved that dial from 10% to 15%, I don't think we understand fully what that would do. That would scare the Democrats to death because they would understand that that's a time that's going to start moving even more so towards they were actually the, thinking. And they start yeah. actually thinking about the issues that matter to the community. And the Republicans would finally say, hey, we're making inroads. We really need to listen to what they have to say and what their issues are. And as I said before, because we've taken ourselves out of that, they've blipped over us and now they've gone on to the Hispanics. Because the Hispanics don't vote like that. And particularly if they're very to, selective. They're very right. selective. You, they they hear the I'm sorry. I they know. listen to the person, to the person yes. rather than the party. Yes. So in Florida, yeah. you get the Cubans who will lay down in traffic <laughs> yeah. for the Republicans. Yeah. So they know, you know, they know how to use their vote, and black folks do not do that. And you know, as I said before about saving money, um, the focus on the hair and the nails, if you don't have a job, you have some sneakers. It's a sneakers. Sneakers. What, what do you need $200 sneakers for you don't have a job? Yes. I mean, I, I could go on, but you know, I really feel the one area where we can make a difference is the vote. Because you don't have to be rich to vote. You just have to be 18 years old and not a felon. Okay. And that's something we don't exercise. Okay, now, like I said, the state of the black community right now, I, I think that in order to reach the youth, like I'm really concerned with the youth right now, it seems that um, some of the some of the hip hop stars, it seems that we immediately defend some of these rappers when they get arrested. We always feel like they're being set up or there's some conspiracy. If you have a gun in your car and they catch you with a gun, you've broken the law. That's right. Okay. Black, white, or purple. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, 
you know, I think that we do ourselves a disservice by consistently just jumping to the defense of someone without understanding that we have to be held accountable for our behavior just like everybody else is. I'm not saying that there are not situations where people are set up, but if somebody clearly shot somebody, or if they have a gun in their car, are they supposed to get off because they sell five lane records? I don't think so. Now, do you lecture the young black females at all? No, I mean, I have one-on-one -on -one mentor relationships with people, but I've never actually had this conversation. But, you know, I, I really feel strongly that we control our own destiny. Go to class. Instead of hanging out in the corner, go to class. You'd be surprised with how far you can get. I think the black community, one of the problems we have, the main problem we have, is that education is not valued to the degree that it needs to be. I went through quite a hard period of my childhood because of that, because of the neighborhood I was in, it was not cool to be smart. I fought through that, paid a price for that yeah. socially, but I fought through that. And I think that we need to understand as, you know, peers to kids, you know, if you're also a kid, not to make somebody feel bad if they go into class, if they're doing better than you. Understand, you know what, maybe I need, I can get something from them going to class. If you're a parent, pay attention to your child if they're not doing their homework, if they need help in the homework, if you can't help them, there's resources out there that can help that kid. Go to the parent-teacher conferences. Be involved in the kid's life. And a lot of people are not, I mean, they're caught up in their own day-to-day -day struggles, and I understand that. I understand it's hard living in certain areas of this country, because you're just trying to survive and make it. But if you don't pay attention to your kid, that's when it goes wrong. And, and you think for someone, let me try to find a word to say. As a Republican, do you think that if more blacks vote Republican, you think that we would see a lot more a lot more positive things happening for us right now? I will put it to you like this. I'm not saying that's the only solution. All I'm saying is that because we blindly pull the lever for one party, neither party is paying attention the way they need to. That's all I can that that's that I can guarantee you. I know for a fact that that's the case. Yes. Okay, thank you, Ms. Jackson, for the interview. Sure. God bless. Thank you. Are there any things you're going to be working on in the future in case anybody wants to look for you? I don't know where my journey is going to take me. I didn't expect the New York Times article. Um, I will be an alternate delegate at the convention, so I will be on the convention floor. So if this is gets in anyone's hands before the convention, look for me. The New York delegation is going to be in the front. Okay, when it's is it? It's going to be New York, California, Texas, right next to each other. So uh, I'll be right there. During what month? Um, uh, the convention is August 30th to September 2nd. Okay, great. Oh, back to back. So look okay. for me on, I'll be sure, I'm sure they'll find some camera shots of the uh -huh. black folks that are in the delegation, so I'm sure you'll see me up there somewhere. Thank you. <laughs> I'm here with E. Leroy Owens, Jr. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Okay, um, we here talking about black Republicans, in which you are. Uh, would you say you came from? A proud black Republican. Okay, all right, get that out there. A proud black Republican. So were you born into a Republican family? Uh, no, I was born into a Democratic Party. Um, um, like Dr. Blakeman just mentioned, um, when I was born and raised, I was born and raised in Florida also. Florida. Tampa, Florida. Okay, and in my community, um, everyone was Democrat. Okay, we didn't think there was another party when I was coming up. I didn't know anything about a Republican Party. Okay, until I came to New York. And I was here around 1980, when Lou Lerman was running for governor of New York State. Uh, I decided to get involved. Lou Lerman's son went to school with my son. They both went to a school called the Buckley School, beside a, a 73rd Street between Lexington and Park Avenue. And I used to meet Lou at a lot of the social um, events, uh, you know, in the school. And one day he asked me, would I get involved in his campaign? And uh, he said, I'm a Republican. I said, a Republican? I can't get involved in your campaign, Lou. <laughs> he said, but I need another voice up in Harlem just to expose what I'm trying to, you know, offer uh, New York State. Uh, so I thought about it. I talked to my wife about it, and she said, well, look, give it a try. What do you have to lose? If he wins the governorship, maybe you can get a better job. <laughs> so I thought about that, you know, and I'd say, well, hey, let me uh, investigate. Let me sit down and talk to Lou. 
see what his pet farm is, some of the things that he want to do for the state of New York. And um, after talking to him, I decided to give it a shot. So I committed myself to organize a group of black blacks up in uh, Harlem was this to get involved. This was the 80s or the 90s? No, it was 1980. Oh, okay. Yeah, he, uh, yeah, 1980. Right. He ran for governor of New York State. So I um, came uptown. I talked to a couple of my friends, and they asked me, they said, "Are you crazy? <laughs> you gonna bring a Repub white Republican up to Harlem?" <laughs> I said, well, look, you know, uh, Democrats are not doing anything for the community. Look at the community. The community is dying right now, you know. Maybe this, uh, this guy might, you know, uh, make a significant difference. By having blacks involved, maybe we might have a voice in helping them, him to shape some of his policies that will affect the whole. So they thought about it. They said, come on, man, let's, let's, let's try it. Let's, let me go out there and meet him. Let me sit and talk and see if we can develop some kind of strategy, you know. So, I got involved in the campaign, a couple of my friends got involved in the campaign, and when we, we got involved with uh, Jean Booker, she's a long, lifelong Republican up in Harlem. Her husband is a newspaper reporter. His name is, um, uh, let's see what's Booker's name. Uh, I can't think of his first name right now, but he was a reporter for the Amsterdam News and a lot of other uh, black newspapers um, in the country. So we both got involved. We got involved with Miss Booker. She was head of the campaign up in Harlem. And uh, we introduced Lou Lerman to the uh, Harlem community. And let me say to you, it was just a traumatic uh, experience. They, the Democrats up there, wanted to physically get involved in preventing us from bringing Mr. Lerman and Mr. Houston, an opposition force, to Harlem. We felt at that time that um, the people of Harlem has been brainwashed to look at one party for the answers to the problems that existed in Harlem. Yes. Okay? We felt that diversity is the route that black folks should be going. They talk about diversity in every other area. When it comes down to politics, diversity have a tendency to take a back seat. Yes. Okay? So we felt that it would be good to hear another voice. So we went through the physical abuse, verbal abuse, um, and all of that stuff to um, to introduce Mr. Lerman to the to the community. Okay, right there. Okay, so why do you think so many blacks vote Democratic automatically? Well, uh, historically, let me just say, let me do a little historical background in terms of the Republican Party as opposed to the Democratic Party. Now, the Republican Party was formed in 1854 as an anti-slavery coalition. The party was built to bring black folks out of slavery. That was the party of um, Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, Booker T. Washington, all of our great blacks of the past. When they evolved out of slavery, they evolved into the Republican Party. Our first elected black officials were black Republicans. They operated in what you call the Reconstruction Congress. That was the Congress that was formed after the Civil War in 1865, okay? And some of your first civil rights bills, the 13th Amendment, which gave, which gave black folks their freedom in America, was introduced and passed by a Republican-controlled Congress at that time. And there were a lot of black elected officials in that Congress. You take the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment was introduced by the same Congress. That amendment dealt with our uh, citizenship here in America. The 14th Amendment guaranteed our citizenship in America. And they also introduced the 15th Amendment, which was passed in 1869, and that amendment gave us the right, believe it or not, to vote. Back in 1869, black folks had the right to vote. Okay? And then during that same Congress, you had Democratic uh, 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 elected officials that voted against these civil rights bills. And that's history. Yeah. You had Democrats during that time that voted against all of the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments, okay? And then after Reconstruction, the Reconstruction period, which is a period that, again, elected a lot of black officials to, to Congress, okay? And black folks, uh, they had a lot of businesses during that, that era. And then uh, you take the white Southerner, Southern Democrat. They instituted, instituted a policy which they call uh, Jim Crow. Jim Crow is a policy that dealt with separate 
but equal, supposedly. Yes, famous. But it, it came out, it came out separate and unequal. Okay? They had black, and they used to call it colored, colored oil fountains, colored bathrooms. And these were the Democrats. These were Democrats. They ran the South. The Democratic Party ran the South doing segregation, doing Jim Crow, doing the lynching. And uh, illiteracy test that kept us from voting. Grandfather clause. Grandfather clause. They introduced all of these um, so-called uh, s- um, uh, prejudicial yes. policies that kept black folks down, Great. kept us, you know, in a very degrading position. That's good to know. Okay, looking at the black community currently in 2004. Okay. In your opinion, are, are you pleased? Absolutely not, because you have to understand a philosophy that blacks evolved by associating with the Democratic Party. You see, blacks were Republicans up until 1936. Even during the first term that Roosevelt ran for office, most blacks voted for Herbert Hoover, believe it or not. So we were very loyal voters. When we were Republicans, we were very loyal to the Republican Party. But after the crash of 1929, and uh, Roosevelt came into power in 32, and he introduced a lot of the um, social WPA programs that was not only geared for black folks, but it was geared to everybody because of a lot of unemployment during that era. So Roosevelt created a lot of government jobs to put people to work, okay? So a lot of people came over to the Democratic Party, including blacks. But the blacks came during the second term, back in 1936. Blacks were Republicans up until 1936. They moved from the Republican Party in 36, and they voted for Roosevelt for the second term, and they became Democrats. And they've been loyal to the Democratic Party ever since. And I don't know why. Because during that era, the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s, there was still Jim Crow down south, uh, run and controlled by Democrats. They introduced literacy tests, um, all kind of tests that was that was holding blacks uh, from back from polling uh, uh, places. They wouldn't allow black folks to vote unless they passed this these tests that they they developed. So you think okay? all, all blacks should be registered voters? Be they should be registered voters, yes. But I don't think they all uh, 92 to 93 percent should be uh, registered in one party, because to me that's political suicide. Because if you're giving all your eggs, putting all your eggs in one basket, the basket that you put it in, which is the Democratic Party, okay, the Democratic Party take those votes for granted. Yes, they, do. they don't have to even think about doing anything. All they have to do is come around and promise. And then we have to promise. Blacks see that Democratic line, they're going to go in that polling booth and vote straight Democrat. Great. Now, what kind of leverage is that? I'm deeply, I'm deeply concerned about our young black men today. There seem to be absolutely no sense of of direction. There seem to be absolutely no sense of connecting to today's society. I'm not saying all young black men are in this category, but there are just too many. And this is our next generation that we are talking about. What are a lot of these young men preparing themselves to do? On the one hand, I see our young black women going to college, getting their education, and coming out with a degree. And on the other hand, I see a lot of the young black men going to jail as their educational um, environment. The education environment is at a conflict with the education that our young black women are getting. So where's the match? Where's the man-woman match that's going to lead the next generation of black folks? You know, there seem to be nothing in common with our educated black women as opposed to our educated black men. So I'm deeply concerned. And there are some ideas that begin to flourish within a lot of the adult 
black men and women that I'm dealing with at this time. Um, we're looking at putting together something like a rites of passage academy for young black men that deals basically with education, cultural, manhood, um, leadership, history, taking and making a commitment to lead the next generation of black folks. We as black men and women need to do this for ourselves, the next generation. We need to leave a legacy for them to tap into. So that's uh, what I'm concerned about right now. I'm not concerned about others coming in solving our problems for us. I'm concerned and I'm working towards forming black folks to take the responsibility to build the next generation that can lead us into a competitive uh, group of people that can go out and compete with any other group that come into America. That's great. That's perfect. And this is my campaign uh, literature, Deloise Blakely for New York State Assembly, 70 A.D. Harlem, and vote for accountable government. And I had Queen Mother Moore, the chairperson, she was a Democrat, and Honorable Eileen Avery, the treasurer of the Republican, and vote for the candidate, not the party, was my slogan. And then I was invited to... Um, the inaugural of George Bush Sr. and the presidential inaugural gala in 1989. And this is George Bush and uh, Quayle. Dan Quayle, James Danforth Quayle. That's potato or tomato, uh, if you misspell. Yes. 1789, 1989. Celebration, and my tickets are here. What's that for? All types of tickets to the various celebrations. What was that? And also, these are the tickets to George Bush Jr. Uh, to the inaugural ceremonies that you have on Capitol Hill. What year was that? This would be the year January 20, 2001. Can I see that one? Could you hold it up? And uh, yes. Can I get a good look at that one? George Bush. Okay. And there's another ticket. I see. I get many tickets, as you can see. So you're very busy. Yes, and then at the inaugural ball, and this would be um, George and Laura Bush. That shows you that I went to the inaugural. Here is mentioned president elect George W. Bush before he became the president. Mm -hmm. I was invited to activities, which you say uh, once he's sworn in, you become the president. Yes. And I was on Capitol Hill, but this is prior where you go to all of the various uh, activities and ceremonies and, uh, you know, as I said. And as you can see, on our chairs, Barbara Bush, his mother, and all the other honorees. And you see this. This is a gift that I receive. I receive some wine glasses as well. And this is at the convention. Um, my tickets at conventions, you receive tickets. I was a guest, I was not a delegate, but a guest at the convention. The convention about to come up in New York City. I'm looking forward to going to the Republican convention uh, as a guest. Oh, and I've great. gone to Democrat as a guest convention. And I've gone to Republican as a guest. And one of these events? Uh, these are the various tickets at the convention. You have to have a ticket to get in. I mean, with the upcoming ones. When, um, when was that it? would be in uh, this summer. It would be this summer in New York. Okay. Uh, yes, Dr. I'm looking forward. Lately. We're going to wrap this interview up. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Well, it's been almost two years since I conducted the interviews for this project. Some things have stayed the same, but some things have definitely changed. George W. Bush won the 2004 election. 
The war in Iraq still shows no sign of ending. Black households still spend more than any other minority group during times of recession. And this recession has left more than half of New York City's black men unemployed, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Stats of 2003. But some things definitely have changed. Just days before the 2005 mayoral election, reigning Republican Mayor Michael Bloomberg and Democratic runner-up Freddie Ferrer are tripping over themselves for the black vote. Yes, finally, the black vote is not being taken for granted. And according to the New York Times September 26, 2005 publication, blacks themselves are changing how we vote. Michael Bloomberg a Republican has 45% of the registered black voter support, while Ferrer, a Democrat, only has 39%. Things are changing definitely for the better, with both Democrats and Republicans realizing that you have to earn the black vote. Gone are the days when black voters just walked in a booth and saw the words Democrat and pulled the lever. Now we want to know what you're about. We want to know what you're going to do for the community if you get our vote. In this October issue of the New York uh, publication, The Village Voice, they show Bloomberg uh, like the jolly green giant. And you see dollar bills all over him that looks like uh, the green giant's grass or whatever leafy uniform. But they say the colossal Bloomberg, the colossus of New York, because not only is, is Michael Bloomberg far richer than uh, Freddie Ferrer, Bloomberg has the minority vote, especially the black vote. Bloomberg has the black vote, and that's something that Ferrer does not have. So with that, with the, with the black population growing in New York and the Hispanic population growing in New York, this makes this election a very interesting one because here you have Bloomberg, who is a Republican, towering over Freddie Ferrer. And the, the publication is funny because when you look at Ferrer's face at the bottom, you see him scared as if he's running. And inside they show a picture of him next to Hillary Clinton uh, to show just how desperate he is to get voters. And with that, you see a big difference in, in, the, in the election in New York, in the energy. You see that now everyone seems to be more concerned with the candidate's background, what the candidate's going to do for their community. They don't care what party you come from. You can be a Republican, Democrat, or, liber or liberal. You have to be saying something that appeals to the community. And I think that Bloomberg, more than Ferrer, has addressed this black male um, unemployment issue in New York. It's a serious crisis because you need to have everyone productive in New York if you expect the crime rate to drop. If you expect people to be enthusiastic about voting, people have to feel like they make a difference. And by feeling like you make a difference, you have to feel like you have some economic power by working. And Bloomberg is addressing those issues better than Freddie Ferrer. So I wouldn't be surprised if Bloomberg wins a second term as the mayor of New York City. Well, that's enough for me. I'm going to continue with my bus ride. As you can tell, I love riding the bus in New York City. The bus is the only place where you can see the transition of each community. That wraps it up for me. I hope you enjoyed watching this documentary. I hope you found it insightful. And I really enjoyed putting it together for you. I hope you enjoyed the pictures. This is Mitchell Holmes a.k.a. M-Rock, and that's it for me. See you next time. Bye.